just to introduce you to Kathy. She's a professor of mycology here at the Department of Botany and Plant Pathology. She's the director of the Arthur Hungarian and Friebel Berberian at Purdue University and a Purdue University faculty scholar. She's re she received her MS and PhD in biology at Virginia Polytech Institute and State University and conducted postdoctoral research at the University of Oxford. She was then an assistant and associate professor at the Department of Plant Pathology and Crop Physiology at, LS at the LSU Agricultural Center until she joined Purdue in 2012. She's the past managing editor of the journal Myco, say that wrong, and <laughs> Mycologia, <laughs> and currently vice president of the International Commission on the Taxonomy of Fungi, which is actually a really interesting, as I understand it. They fight a lot, like <laughs> barcodes. Oh, is that a trigger word? That's just yeah. the <laughs> <laughs> Oh, right. Um, she is an executive committee member of the International Mycological Association and vice president of the Mycologic Mycological Society of America. She's a fellow of the Mycological Society of America, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Explorers Club, and the Linnaean Society of London. She won numerous awards, which probably doesn't surprise you, uh, including but not limited to the William H. Western Award for Excellence in Teaching for the Mycological Society of America, Purdue University Agricultural Research Award, Department of Botany and Pathology Outstanding Graduate Advisor Mentor Award, and the Department of Botany and Plant Pathology Richard Cole's Outstanding Teacher in the College of Ag. Um, so Kathy's research combines expeditionary field work, so very Indiana Jones. <laughs> Uh, and traditional approaches with molecular genetics and various omics approaches. And I think her work really beautifully illustrates the uh, power of approaching evolutionary and ecological questions in particular from various uh, perspectives. Um, she's been remarkably productive with more than 224 peer reviewed publications, including an eye popping 40 peer reviewed publications in the last two years. Um, and her work has been cited more than 16,000 times. So it's so nice to say we are fortunate to have her here and fortunate to have her speak today. So please. Okay, well, that was really nice. And I wish my mother was watching. <laughs> asking what I do. <laughs> um, so, you know, I was thinking about what to talk about, and it dawned on me that I've never actually given a um, departmental seminar in object science. So thank you for this opportunity very much, Damon. And, and for most of you who, who know me, I, um, I am director of our herbaria here, and this is actually why I came to Purdue, uh, because the Arthur herbaria is the single most important collection of breast fungi in the world. And a lot of my work deals with the evolutionary history of breast fungi. And we have a lot of really exciting things going on right now. We've been utilizing these collections to develop a model for how complex life cycles evolved in plant pathogens. No such model exists. We have models for, for uh, animal pathogens, but we don't for plant pathogens. So We've made a lot of headway in that area and on certain rusts of importance like coffee rust lately. It's very exciting. But then I decided, you know, it's practically Christmas, it's end of the semester, nothing too heavy. So, what I'm going to talk about today is actually something a little more fun. And it's um, the stories about a couple of fungi we've, we've been working on in neotropical systems and um, their dispersal traits and how that. Um, informs not just systematics, but the evolutionary adaptations of these fungi that have been risen in these particular ecosystems. I'm going to get up on my teaching podium for just a moment and say that um, one of the goals in biology really is knowing how many species there are on the planet. And this, of course, is the pursuit of systematics. And that's basically what I am, a systematic mycologist, although the, that pursuit has taken me in all sorts of directions. 
And just for the students, any students listening, you know, Tom Bruns at Berkeley recently calculated that um, even though it is believed that there are probably 20 times more species of fungi than plants, there are 30 times more botanists in the United States than mycologists. And so mycology, this is all by ways of saying that some of the stuff I'm showing here today, it's new information. We still have a lot of headway to make in understanding fungi and their roles in ecosystems. And that's what um, people like me and the students in my lab are trying to do ultimately in the end. Um, I use this term a lot, systematics. I am a systematist. And basically what systematists are concerned, of course, with biodiversity and the rules of naming and preserving biodiversity and identifying it. But we're also very, very um, interested in evolutionary aspects of this biodiversity and especially how the adaptations of these organisms make them fit for the environment. And so that's the aspect that I want to talk about today is this evolutionary history of some of these new species we've discovered. And so I'm going to approach this from the angle of dispersal. Because you're all familiar with fungi, they disperse by spores. And these spores can either be sexually reproduced or asexually reproduced. So they're produced by meiosis or mitosis. But basically spores are how we think about fungi getting around. And there's lots of adaptations for how these spores are spread. But I'm going to show you some examples of fungi for which we absolutely could not figure out how they were dispersed. And of course, understanding these dispersal strategies is really paramount for explaining how organisms are adapted for their particular environment. And before I get started, my biggest um, acknowledgement here is to Dr. Rachel Cook. Um, Rachel was a graduate student with me at LSU. She moved here to Purdue with me, became my postdoc, and we worked together for six years in both Cameroon and Guyana. And she uh, is really the result of a lot of her persistence in the field that allowed us to, to draw some of the conclusions I'll show you today. This is Rachel, you know, in, on the equator, the sun sets at six o'clock and then you're in these remote field conditions with no electricity. You've got to rig up your, your light source and keep on going however you can. So the first fungus I want to talk about is this thing, right? more of a granicarpus. And this is what it looks like in the field. It's just this stringy, Fungus, about that big, the individual strings with these little knobby projections on the tips of it. And the name itself, Rhizomorpha, is what we call a junk name. It's a taxonomic placeholder for anything that we don't really know where it belongs. It forms something called rhizomorphs, which are these long stringy threads. And so um, this fungus. Um, had originally been described from Suriname, was only known from Suriname, no idea what it was or what it did in the environment. But we started seeing it all over in various field sites in Guyana and Belize and Costa Rica and in Peru. And basically in the field, um, a young rhizomorpha sort of forms these sheets of vegetative material or rhizomorphs, and then as it gets more mature, again, puts out these knobby structures. And we realized very quickly that it was doing a couple of things in these ecosystems. And one of the things it's doing is forming these litter traps. You guys familiar with what these are? So these are actual aerial webs. And this is quite large. This is one that fell on the ground so we were able to pick this one up. But these attach throughout the canopy in tropical systems and collect leaf litter as it falls and decompose it before it ever hits the ground. So they're very, very important in nutrient recycling in these tropical systems, but we don't know much about them. Again, mycologists aren't usually up in the canopy. We're down on the ground, so it's just when you get one knocked down that you can really study it. But one thing you can see is that they form these specialized structures. This is right in North again, it's been called a busy, and they use this attachment and then it'll move from one piece of leaf to another or one branch to another and trap these leaves, again, for decomposition mostly. But we also noticed that these were involved in pathogenicity, or at least it looked like they were involved in blighting of young woody saplings and seedlings. And so this raised the question of what exactly this thing was. Nobody knew. 
and um, the morphology gives us absolutely no indication at all. If you are to take a slice through one of these ribomorphs, it's very simple structure. The inner cortex just has generative hyphae. That means thin walled hyphae with specialized structures. We call it dendrohyphidia, these little curly knobby things on it. And the outer cortex here is composed of skeletal hyphae. These are very thick walled, um, sturdy structures. And that's it. There's no spore production ever noted in this thing. We have cultured it. It doesn't produce culture or spores in culture or in the field. So um, if you know anything about fungi, everything is classified according to spores. And when you have something that doesn't produce spores, that's why you put it in a just a vegetative genus like Rhizomorpha. So Rachel did sequencing of this thing, and um, here are a bunch of collections we made. And we were actually able to place it into another genus called Bruneo Cortisium. And Bruneo Cortisium is what we would call a crust fungus. So it forms a very thin crust-like layer over substrates where it does decomposition, but it also produces spores. That crust layer is a hymenium. So, um, and it has these dendrohyphidia, which seem to be a united feature of the genus. So we could place it, we placed it in this family Merasmiaceae, which was a bit surprising because Merasmiaceae are little mushrooms for the most part. And if you've ever been, even in our temperate forest here, these members of the genus Merasmus, for instance, are the number one uh, decomposers of leaf litter on forest floors. So you will find many, many species of these in tropical and temperate forest decomposing leaf litter. But um, for most of uh, the past 100, 150 years, it was thought that Merasmiaceae were solely decomposers. Um, work done in my lab over the past two decades has shown that we actually have a lot of plant pathogens here. This is Moneliophthora perniciosa, which causes a disease of cacao. And uh, reduced forms, such as this little ketoclapis here, which is about half a millimeter in diameter, but it still has a high medium, so it's still producing spores. We have things like Bruneo corticium, we now know, which is this crust fungus, and even more reduced forms, such as this one here, which is Moneliophthora aurorii, which only forms conidia in a sort of a sheet, so asexual spores only. But all of these things belong to Merasmiaceae, and the picture we're beginning to develop for this group is they have the enzymatic capacity to decompose lignin and cellulose, so we can find these as tropical tree pathogens, which certainly fits with what we've observed in the field for Bruneo corticium. But what it doesn't tell us still is how Bruneo corticium is getting dispersed. We have no idea. There's no spore production. Um, so repeated collections in the field by myself and colleagues at the USDA Forest Service um, have picked up the fungus now. Remember, it was just originally identified in Suriname, sorry, Suriname, and we picked it up all over sort of this neotropical belt here. And um, also have observed it, although not collected it in this portion. So again, it seems to have this huge range here. So this is something that is able to get around somehow, <laughs> even without producing any spores. And it turns out a lot of the places we found this thing was in bird nests. Mm -hmm. So you can see it here incorporated in bird nests in several of these different countries. And in fact, um, Joe Wunderly, who is the, a ornithologist, who's the husband of Gene Lodge at the Forest Service, he took many pictures of these birds actually sitting on the nest with these Bruneo corticium in them. And this one here, the bare neck fruit crow, just to make one example. Uh, here's a picture of it actually carrying this material around. And when I started looking up data on this particular bird, I found a picture on eBird just posted there with the, with the thing carrying around Bruneo corticium on eBird. Um, and here's the range for just this bare neck fruit crow. And you see how this is almost identical to the range for the Bruneo corticium as well. Territories for these birds, very little understood about tropical 
of bird territory, but it's probably about 14 hectares and the home range is probably about 56 hectares. Mm -hmm. So certainly our hypothesis now is that it's, it's probably birds are the primary dispersers of this fungus. So that brings us to our bird nests and why would birds incorporate these things other than it's just another handy substrate, but certainly they seem to be specifically picking up Bruneo forticium. And if we hypothesize they're the primary dispersal agents, there must be some adaptive reason for this to be so. And so here's, when we did all this bird nest collecting, we did this primarily in Guyana and Costa Rica, and we always look for abandoned bird nests. So all the data I could give you are only on abandoned nests. But when you pick up a nest that's on the ground, and look at some of these closely. You see this little mushroom fruiting in here? It is fruiting from a rhizomorph. So this is a fungal rhizomorph right here incorporated in the nest, and here's the marasmus. And so Rachel and I had found enough of these that we decided we'd do a quick and dirty study and see what we could find out about rhizomorph incorporation of bird nests. Um, we did this study just, again, one field season in Guyana and one in Cameroon, but basically we collected all the abandoned nests we could find and we categorized them whether the rhizomorphs were being used for attachment or structure, the outside structure of the nest, or for lining of the nest. So we categorized them and then we took little pieces of rhizomorph uh, into DNA buffer, and we collected all the morasmiaceae that we could find in the vicinity as well, so we could hopefully match some of these up with fruiting bodies to get an idea what they were. Prior to us doing this work in the literature, all rhizomorphs that had been noted as being incorporated with in bird's nests were put in a single species, morasmias crinoseki. So, of course, one of our questions was, is this true? Is it just Krinoseki and the others? What are they doing there? Well, of course, it's not just Krinoseki. We found at least 25 different species of Erasmus. They're the ones shown in the blue here, incorporated in the bird nests in uh, tropical regions. And what's more, some of these are, are data, you know, and they're not really significant yet. We don't have a lot of data points, but they are strongly suggested that some of these are being used exclusively as lining and some exclusively for attachment or structure. So why might this be so? Um, there is a study specifically looking at the tensile strength and hydrophobicity of rhizomorphs in bird's nests in a neotropical setting that finds that these rhizomorphs have a much higher tensile strength. Again, these are usually causing these litter traps. Um, so they've got to be able to hold a lot of weight. And that they're very hydrophobic, much more so than any of the other nest construction material. And again, in a tropical setting, you can see how having the ability to repel water to keep your nest dry, your nest limbs dry, load, uh, keep your parasite load down. What we didn't know is about the ones just used for lining, but we did find that there are many morassian species noted for antibiotic properties. So we started form this hypothesis. Well, maybe the ones being used as lining have antibiotics that, of course, again, are keeping the parasite load down. So this is still in work, but the first thing we had to do is demonstrate that these rhizomorphs were still viable. And from the abandoned nests, what you're looking at here is a culture plate where we surface sterilized the rhizomorphs, played them out, and you can see the fungus growing out of the two sides of the rhizomorph there. So these are, are viable, and right now we're doing um, proteal mix to see what kind of meta metabolite these are pro uh, producing. So this, this work is still in progress, but that's, that's our reigning hypothesis at this point in time. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears now and talk about our last story here, which is a bit more complete. And it takes place in Guyana. Um, I'm going to Guyana again in a couple of days, first time back in about two years to pick up some of this field work. But for those of you who know me, I've been working in this region for about 22 years. And uh, it's a very remote region. I'll, I'll, I'll belabor this point because it explains why it took us 10 years to work out the next story in, in small part. 
uh, back when I was skinny, but we get on these uh, air services charters and we fly out to the Pacaraima Mountains. This is part of that Tapui region. Um, Conan Doyle wrote about it. It's the last world where he hypothesized there are all sorts of crazy animals and dinosaurs hanging out on top of these tapuis. But this is the oldest um, geological formation on Earth. And uh, Guyana has the largest tract of virgin rainforest still on the planet. So the, um, and this is Qatar Falls. This is the Pataro River and that's Mount Ayangana in the back. Qatar is the second tallest single drop waterfall in the world. Uh, again, all part of this tabletop mountain to the region. And when we get out, we land at this abandoned mining camp out here where we pick up our Patamona. These are um, Native Americans from the Patamona tribe that live out in the Pacaraima in Region 8 in Guyana. So we've been working with the same guys here for again more than 20 years. Every year they hike out and meet us. And we load everything up in the dugout and start taking it up the Pitaro, which is that waterfall river I showed you. Um, Guyana means, or Guyana means land of many waters. So there's tons of rivers involved. So we do a lot of this um, uh, portaging of the contents of the canoe. Uh, this is the monkey bridge as we have nicknamed it. <laughs> Lots of these sort of types of crossing. So we can get to where we sort of set up our permanent or the same site we go back to year after year, build our camp. Uh, we bring all the tarps and everything, um, build our research station. You can see the hammocks hanging up in the back where we sleep. This is my desk uh, built out of palm wood. And um, thanks to Purdue, you can almost see the Purdue label here, but John Cavaletto donated uh, to uh, dissecting scopes to us. And Rachel and I managed to bring these up with headlamps so we can use them on the field as well. And so um, many, many projects going on in Guyana through the years, but what I wanna focus now is on this new genus and species we described uh, more than 10 years ago now, Anagaster mycorrhizus. And in this original paper, you can see the fungus. It's what we call a sequestrate fungus, which means that the gleba or the spore producing hymenium is enclosed. So mushrooms are open where the spores have free access. And the sequestrate fungi, the, the spores are all produced inside this enclosed structure here. And um, What's interesting about Guyana gastronecorrhizis is we determined in this paper when we described it that it was closely related to Arbillaria. Now this is our sympatric Arbillaria species out there. But Arbillaria, anybody heard of the humongous fungus? So these are famous for forming the largest and the oldest organisms on earth. So they're really, really huge. The, um, the, the thalli, the, the range of the uh, the individual ballast of these things. And so this was kind of an interesting finding, especially because as far as we knew, Guyana gasser only existed, the genus only existed up in the Pacarama Mountains. But this is um, sort of where Rachel stepped in and took off. And one of the first things she did was just um, resolve, of course, your typical phylogenetic tree, but resolve that Guyana gasser was indeed um, sister to our malaria and its relatives. And she's got a really nice story here about the evolution of rising warts in the genus our malaria is likely what drove this genus to become both pathogenic and huge, able to cover huge clonal distances. What we didn't know about, didn't know at the time was anything really about Guyana gaster other than that it was a sequestrate sister to this, this mushroom genus. So this, this has actually been bugging me for a long time. Um, if you know anything about these sequestrate fungi or what are sometimes called gastromycetes stomach fungi, not because they look at like stomachs, but because the spores are produced internally. What we know about gastromycetes or sequestrate fungi, again, is pretty much all based on temperate systems. But for these fungi, they developed or evolved two different spore dispersal mechanisms. 
And one syndrome is dispersal by wind or rain. And here's just the characters for these things. But basically, for these types of fungi, puffballs a good example. You have a raindrop hit that, and you see the spores puff out, right? So that's a very mechanical type of passive spore production or spore dispersal. And then we have things like truffles and hysterangia that are also sequestrate, that are usually hypogeous, which means they're underground, and they emit chemical signals, pheromones, that cause animals, mammals, or pigs to dig them up, consume them, and disperse the spores that way. Spores actually go through what we call a gut passage syndrome, where they're adapted to go through an animal tract, come out and germinate on the other side. Um, lots of characteristics for either of these dispersal mechanisms, but none of those characteristics apply to Gyanogaster. Instead of a thin exoperidium, that's this covering here, is very, very thick rock-like and completely resistant to any kind of decay or wounding. They're subhypogeous, so they're partially underground, but a good deal of it is exposed above ground which doesn't fit either of these dispersal syndromes. The gleba itself is gelatinous of maturity, and very, very thick, which is very unusual. And it doesn't give off any animal or at least non-human detectable odors, um, such as truffles and hysterangiums, things that, that are adapted for mammal dispersal always give off odors that you can detect at maturity. And again, as far as we could tell, it was an endemic genus. It had never been even since we've described it, nobody, even people working in um, the Northern Atlantic Forest in Brazil have seen anything like it. So the question in the back of my mind was always, how is this thing getting dispersed? It's not wind or rain or animals. What the heck is doing it, right? Um, organisms that are passively dispersed have dispersal patterns, of course, that mirror that of their vector. And so that got me and Rachel thinking, what we needed to do is try a population genetics approach and we see what the dispersal range for this thing is and that'll give us some way to narrow down what the vector might be. And so um, took uh, over two years collecting um, in two different rotations with about 55 patches of these, collecting all the basidiomes, getting a genome in order to develop our, our, our microsatellites and then do the analyses. And we did this not just for Gyanogaster, but for another new genus we described out there called Pseudotelosma. Pseudotelosma we knew was wind dispersed, so this was sort of our control for our method. And here's our two sites, Magora and Pataro, and they're separated by about 100 kilometers. So we went one Christmas to Magora and then the rest of the time out to uh, the Pataro site. And we found certainly lots and lots of evidence that pseudotelosma volvata is, um, the gene flow is, is quite apparent. There's a lot of shared alleles between these two sites, Mogoro, Mogoro and Pataro. And for Gyanogaster, absolutely not a single shared allele between these two sites. So that was telling us that gene flow is actually happening at a very small scale, less than 100 meters. So likely not to be wind or large animals, large mammals at least. And when we actually get down and fine tune um, our scaling here, so sorry, taking Magora out of the picture, this is just looking at our Pitaro site and four different areas that we sampled here that are about two kilometers distant from each other. And from a structure analysis, you can see that it's split up into about eight populations. God, I keep knocking over your camera. <laughs> eight populations just within the Pataro site and 120 unique MLGs. So at any patch that contain more than two individuals is likely to have at least two different genotypes. So it's the exact opposite of the humongous fungus, which has one MLG that covers 64 hectares or something. In this case, we have 120 unique MLGs in this small area here. And we actually did spatial structure analyses as well, as well at each of our different sites. But basically, we were finding that uh, all these measures, both 
the regular structure and the spatial structure at each site, we're predicting dispersal to be at the scale of about five to 10 kilometers. So what on earth is working at a dispersal scale that small or that fine? Well, here's a mature Gyanogaster. At the final stage of maturity, we would often pick these up where it'll be termites. And um, termites, you know, are one of the most common components of these forest systems. They're everywhere. Here's a regular bunch of termites. Here's a bunch of termites that have been feeding on Gyanogaster. So they're chock full of glue, so they're really feeding on this thing. And we originally thought that perhaps this was a gut passage syndrome, like you see with truffles and things that adapt to go through an animal gut. But when we actually look at the termite feces, these spores are not intact. These are spores all from inside or from feces, and these are spores from the gleba. So it didn't look like animal passage at all. So we're still trying to figure out how find termites feeding on it, but how are they dispersing it? Well, if you look really closely, you see all the spores stuck to the snake here. Remember, this has a very gelatinous leba. And these were termites that we collected in the field and stuck in ethanol, so they still had these uh, spores stuck on them. And you can see this in a couple of instances here. Again, spores being vectored by these termites. So we started thinking, well, maybe we're looking at some incipient agriculture because we know that termites, of course, have been used to farm fungi or farm fungi in, in the old world tropics. But it turns out it's not one species, it's several species that we collected inside these, but they're all within a single family of termites, which are the soil and wood termites, human termites. Uh, termites are, again, a huge percentage of the biomass or the animal biomass in uh, tropical systems, hyper-diverse in the Guillermo Shield. And these are sort of our ecosystem engineers here. Um, what's interesting is in the old world, of course, we have that instance of termites doing the animal farming there, uh, or the animal farming, the fungus farming in the old world, where they farm the vegetative part of the fungus, fungus called Trigetomyces and feed on that, but we don't have any other records of termites feeding or exclusively feed, feeding on sexual structures of a fungus. So, um, and, and the, the range, the forage range of the termites fits right in perfectly with what we were looking at, what we got for our dispersal ranges as well. So um, hypothesis is that these termites are vectoring the spores. Um, to support that hypothesis, first of all, we needed to know the nutritional strategy of Guyana Gaster, um, because part of the model we're building is that this would make good sense if Guyana Gaster is also a wood feeder, right? So Rachel did the um, genome analyses, and these are all the different enzymes involved in breaking down woody substrates. And Guyana Gaster, of course, has a full complement of the celluloses and lignases we would expect in a wood decomposer. So it looks like um, these guys do share the same substrate. So termites then make a really good vector, a targeted vector to new substrates for this fungus. But what this doesn't explain to us is why would termites wanna get involved in this partnership, right? So it makes sense from Diana Gaster's point of view to get targeted dispersal to wood, woody substrates. But for the termite, we were scratching our head. And then um, Rachel made another discovery here. And we often, when we collect Guyana Gaster in the field, we try to pure culture it. Our methods for that are to break open the fungus and take a piece of tissue from the gleba and plate that out in PDA with antibiotics. And most of the time when she did that, she'd get these bacteria to grow out of the gleba instead of the darn fungus. I mean, sometimes we could get the fungus, but bacteria would always overrun it. And most of the time, at least the first year or so, we were like contamination, contamination. And Rachel was like, well, let's find out what the bacteria are, right? It turns out that all the bacteria that live inside Diana Gaster belong here to the Enterobacteriaceae. And what we know about the Enterobacteriaceae, of course, these are gram negative factor plated anaerobes, but they're involved, many of them, at least in nitrogen fixation. 
And so if you know anything about wood feeding organisms, anything that depends on wood as a substrate is going to be nitrogen starved. This goes for fungi or animals. Your termites and wood feeding beetles have a whole plethora of microorganisms to supplement their nitrogen diet. Fungi like um, our nematode trapping fungi have special structures to trap animals to supplement that nitrogen diet. And so we started hypothesizing that maybe Guyana gaster is using these bacteria to fix nitrogen inside the gleba to reward the termites with spore dispersal. So how do we go about proving that? So this, um, oh, one more part of the story. So we also went back and did, that was just straight sequencing and phylogenetics, but we did a metagenomic um, sampling also of the, the bacteria in different maturity classes. So we basically classified our Diana gasters MG one, two, three, four, four being the mature stage, one being completely mature, and then the surrounding soil. And what we found, of course, was that Guyana gaster was in very, the mature stages were heavily enriched for these nitrogen fixing bacteria. And uh, you can see even from the P, two different types of PCA, the PCA and the COP, but it's a different cohort of enterobacteriaceae. As the fruiting bodies mature, they get selected and we place all the other bacteria in there. And when we look at the individual um, components of the bacteria for, because there's many um, individual species, but the one that's most frequent, which is what we call AFC um, three, is actually a new species that we haven't determined yet what that species is, but that's the bacteria that at maturity makes up almost the entire population of the gliba. So is it really nitrogen fixing as we hypothesize? And this is where young me helped us out and we developed an acetylene reduction assay that we could actually tailor and do out in the field out there. So um, try explaining to customs, you know, why you're bringing like 2000 vials of blood serum and stuff like that out in the field. <laughs> But anyway, we managed to get this assay working out in the field, brought all of our vials of gas back, um, young me ran them, and found that in this mature gliba, we have a significant increase in nitrogenase activity, which is the enzyme, of course, that fixes nitrogen. And in addition, we did the chemical analyses to show that those mature gliba are heavily enriched for nitrogen, again, compared to the immature gliba or the roots on which the Guyana gaster was, was attached. So it does seem to support our hypothesis that Guyana gaster fruiting body is used to house these bacteria that increase nitrogen content at maturity and presumably reward the termites for feeding on it and, and dispersing the spores. We also found we did some other um, tests of, of, uh, of our model, including looking at superoxide dismutase, which is the enzyme, of course, that, um, that gets rid of the oxygen so we can keep an anoxic environment. Um, the protein is upregulated in mature gliba, and the gyanogaster genome is double duplicated the number of copies of this particular gene compared to its relatives here. And then um, we looked at a couple of other things, including how the ATP is derived to run all this nitrogen fixation and basically found all of the products or the byproducts of ethylene, um, ethylene ethanol, <clears throat> ethanol fermentation uh, within the gliba, which again is um, an anoxic uh, process, but that would produce enough ATP for bacteria to do the nitrogen fixation. We found one secondary metabolite cluster here, which is of interest because within this cluster, this was actually the question that originally got me started on this whole pro project was uh, what's attracting the termites. And we've actually found now 
that there are two different terpene synthases. Terpenes are the chemical trail markers that termites lay down to attract each other and follow each other. And Diana gas are actually a significantly increased in terpene synthesis uh, in the mature gleba, which we think is the attractant for the termites as well. And then looked again at the physical mechanism for attachment of the spores. In the mature gleba here, as I've mentioned before, these things are very, very gelatinous, which is an unusual feature. And it turns out we've got this, um, this particular protein that's upregulated in the mature gleba that matches a protein in the Arabidopsis seed coats that's, that's used for um, um, basically mucilage production. So we think that's what it's using to uh, attach itself to the termites. So our model, a little bit packed, but basically we are modeling or um, proposing that so of course cyanic acid is going through all these interior and exterior changes. All of these adaptations are for the explicit purpose of um, producing an anoxic environment that promotes the growth and nitrogen fixation of these bacteria that again, in turn, offers a reward to termites for dispersing the spores. So um, to get back to our original questions, which were just, it was such a morphologically unusual fungus to us. Why is it so morphologically unusual? And we think again that most of these changes in the morphology we see in Diana Gaster can be explained um, through this lens of its adaptations for termite um, dispersal and nitrogen fixation. So we have this very, very thick, hard, decay resistant exoperidium, like we don't see in other fungi. But uh, we believe that helps create and keep this anoxic environment. Uh, which is ideal for nitrogen fixation and fermentation. The fact that the thing is subhypogeous, it means it's right at termite level, basically. So it's not hypogeous like we usually see um, in these types of fungi. I didn't mention before, but these things have an extraordinarily long maturation period. Um, we don't know how long, but we know it's more than a year. And again, for a fungus, the Cidiomyces fruiting body, that's just unheard of to have it a year long maturation period. But the very immature ones that we've marked in the field and then gone away for a year and come back, they're just approaching maturity then. So it's very, very long. And again, we think this, this helps ensure that termites know that they have a steady source of nitrogen that will produce all year round. And this is all the different stages of maturity that you can find in one particular patch. So it's constantly fruiting asynchronously. Again, we hypothesize for the benefit of the termites. And then, of course, the um, gelatinous gleba um, helps adherence to the termite exoskeleton. And um, as, again, as far as we know, and it's been um, 12 years since we published this genus, and as far as we know, it is endemic to this particular part of the Guiana Shield. And again, the really, really specific way that this thing has evolved to utilize termites might help explain why this particular fungus is endemic. Um, this is our first example of nitrogen fixing association in the sexual structures of fungi. This is our first example of termites feeding on the sexual structures of fungi or vectoring, specifically being used to vector from the spores, biospores. Um, first example of arthropod dispersed phosphate fungus. And it really highlights the metabolic uh, flexibility and capacity of the basic fungal genome uh, that would allow the, fix, uh, the facilitation of nitrogen fixation and all these different trophic level associations that hadn't previously been thought about. So I would be remiss without thanking, especially a little Patagonia. Uh, here we are at the old abandoned mining camp, waiting for days and days for the plane to come get us out of there. <laughs> and of course, all my students past and present, um, just a few pictured here, but uh, even if they weren't involved in this work, you know, the students are always uh, keeping the science interesting. So I thank them. Thank you, guys.
Okay, with that, uh, there any questions? I, I guess this question is coming in probably through the, the Zoom as well. Not yet, but I'll. And I can, I can kick it off. This to me is beautiful. And it's such a great example of how many cool discoveries start with. That's weird. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like, why did it do that? Gorgeous. Yeah. So uh, I guess a question I would have, and this probably has to be a collaboration between you and, and other scientists, is this is co-evolution, presumably. So do you have any sense of how the termites or the birds are being affected by this association and how, how they restricted they become? No, and that's a really, really good question, Damon. I don't. Um, I have these. I have feelers out to a lot of other tropical uh, ornithologists and uh, entomologists to try and, and, and look at this. You know, whether, yes, because it, it, this is a fungal specific angle, but yes, we are hoping eventually to show some kind of co cool evolution. Yeah, well, um, maybe the, this is a, like with Guyana gaster, it could be a really early incipient stage. We seem to have one actual bacteria that seems involved mm -hmm. for this habitat. We have a lot of different termites that are hooking in right now, but I need the expertise of somebody, um, an entomologist, to see if we can see that there's one that's being selective or taking advantage of Do you think it right? could sort of restrict the range of some of these? Animals or termites, so that they, they really just have to be in that area. Yeah. Yes, if they become dependent on this for nitrogen source, and now it's going to restrict the range, yeah. which could be why, again, we're seeing so much endemism. And uh, we don't know if those termite species, there's no good atlas, it turns out, to those group of termites in the shield. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we can't identify with that species. We think that might want to know. Well, you know, that's a great question, Scott, because of course it does. The forest with Guyana gaster are these monodominant forests that are driven by the Sandy Corundosa, yeah, which is that so my book. Yeah. <laughs> so teasing out whether it's the termites or the trees or some synergistic combination of the both that have and made these, these forests what they are today is a really good question. Is it pretty nitrogen fixing? Um, the tree is not nitrogen fixing, no. It's a legume and it's not nitrogen fixing. It's actually a demycorrhizal. Wow. Yeah. Any questions for you? Yep. Why are they red at maturity? Oh, such a good question. So we don't have the answer to that. So we've ruled out melanin, any kind of B12, even any kind of hemes and things of bacteria producing it or something. It's not any of those. We still don't know what that red coloration is, but I have a collaborator in Germany who did some secondary metabolites. And right now they are trying to figure out what pigment is and what the terpenes are. Yeah, we went down a lot of rabbit holes thinking, oh, it's melanin. That makes sense. Yeah, I was thinking. Yeah. There's a lot of nodules. Have heme in them, exactly. And they're red inside too. So, yeah, but no, it's not heme. It's extremely high genetic diversity. How do they maintain that? Yeah, well, can you repeat the question? Oh, sure. So Chris's question was about um, the high genetic diversity of necorrhizas, given the short dispersal of distance. And um, each of those basidiocarps has one to three billion spores in it. They're all genetically different. So it's, it's a local level of allelic diversity basically being shuffled up, yeah. Yeah, the, um, one part of the story I didn't get into is um, our fungus at Mabora does not, even though it looks pretty much identical, it does not crossbreed with the fungus at Pitaro, so it's actually a different species at Mabora. So we've got, uh, I mean, what some people call St. Patrick, 
speciation at 100 kilometers, <laughs> basically. They are two completely isolated species. Yeah, Aren't there other instances of like fungus not having any sexual stage, like the bird, one dispersed by bird stick? There are lots of instances of not having a sexual stage. So there are fungi that are known only as asexually reproducing. What the little bit unusual about that one is it doesn't even have an asexual stage, no, no reproductive uh, propagules at all, no diaspores at all. It's just vegetative as far as we can tell. We and about 50 years of people uh, at least notice them in the Suriname. And so enough of that every 100 years or so, this is it just right? That it screws, yeah, it may very well be. It may very well be that, that we would need to do some good top gen and see if that's happened in the past and we haven't done that yet. What kind of fear, to what kind of view do you lose the floods in America? Is there an instinct? Yeah, I, I heard about the birds that fly in Central America. Did you want to go back to North America? What was the goal in North America? Yeah, you know, that's a good question because that, like that, that crow bird and the other ones I showed are, are all South American. And so it did somehow get dispersed to Central America. Um, whether that was a hurricane, a bird on a hurricane or something, uh -huh. boundary effect, I don't know. But um, what's interesting about that too, gosh. I'm still looking forward to getting back to Diana. Mm -hmm. This is the one from Belize. Uh, these are all from South America, different places in South America. So it does look, I mean, we've got one data point country here and things about it, excuse my language, yeah. But um, if I had to make a hypothesis, I would say that they've been separated a long time too. This was probably a boundary event, and that might be a separate species now too in such a group. We need lots more data points for that. Like those termites are smart to steal that bacteria. Yeah, exactly, for themselves, and then they wouldn't need the uh, Diana Blaster. I'm glad they're not so smart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? All right, well, with that, I very much want to thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.